When you excavate a hole in the ground, it's almost inevitable that you'll get settlement at the surface. The solution we adopted to try and reduce the number of buildings we went under was to put it wherever possible under uh, an existing busy live railway. That brought its own issues because any mishaps in the tunnelling under the railway could have been disastrous. And we had agreed with the underground that we would only tunnel as long as the movements were within very, very strict and limited uh, dimensions. The TBM's earth pressure balancing system is designed to keep the ground over the tunnel from settling. Even settlement, the thickness of a toenail, could cost a fortune. Indeed, at Highbury Station, uh, we had a settlement limit of one millimetre. If we'd have exceeded that, the whole station would close down, cost of £25 million a week. And that was very anxious moments, because the London Underground could have closed our operation down, could have stopped the project. Six TBMs in all are burrowing. Two from the East End, and two pairs from Stratford. Other crews dig ventilation shafts to dissipate pressure when trains race through the tunnel. The shafts can also be used in an emergency. To allow the emergency services to get to a failed train in a reasonable time frame, the ventilation shafts had to be located at a sensible distance apart, and that distance was seen to be three kilometers. Crews are working miles apart, yet all the tunnels and shafts must align within millimeters. Very, very small uh, tolerances because the actual train being high speed can't deviate in line or level. Some very accurate surveying needs to happen on the Channel Tunnel rail link. It's so long that you have to take uh, account of the Earth's surface in the surveying. Such precise surveying couldn't happen without lasers and GPS. Long before trains start to run, the ventilation shafts play a crucial role when the TBMs hit flint. It's a very hard and very abrasive material. It's been known to completely destroy uh, cutter heads within as little as 200 metres of driving a tunnel. And so therefore, we had to design the head of the tunnel boring machine to be able to crunch through flints and to turn them into smaller parts that we could then take through our slurry machine. They modify the cutter head with nearly 50 cutter discs each a tonne of hardened steel. They exert so much pressure, they shatter flint. Yet even steel discs wear out. When a tunnel boring machine arrived at a ventilation shaft position, the cutting blades were inspected and, where necessary, replaced. And as a consequence, the tunnel boring machines were capable of completing the whole tunnel from one end to the other without major breakdowns or refurbishments. I think probably the, the only major urban tunneling scheme in the UK uh, in my lifetime that's come in on time and budget. An enormous success story. In the heart of London, another success story emerges from a big hole a maintenance depot for Eurostar trains called the Stratford Box. It lies along the London tunnels between the Thames on the east and St Pancras on the west. The ground is so waterlogged it could flood the depot. Engineers have two choices. We could either make the thickness of the base slab very, very, very thick so it stayed in the ground, or you could do what we decided to do, which was to pump. Underground pumps drain enough water every day to overflow an Olympic swimming pool. Interesting enough, the water is of such a quality that we have then used that and we give that to the Water Authority for London. 
When complete, Stratford Box is 55 metres wide and more than a kilometre long. And such a, a large box gave us the opportunity to actually say, well, well, we think we should have a station in this location. The introduction of this station, little do we realise, would actually be the genesis of the Olympics coming to London. A stone's throw from Stratford Box is a floodplain with a hundred empty acres. Using dirt from the box and the London tunnels, engineers raised the land seven metres above the plain. A perfect site for an Olympic park. London has already put in its bid for the 2012 Games to the International Olympic Committee, the IOC. To win the bid, London has to prove it can move millions of fans speedily and easily, and High Speed One holds the answer. Shuttles could whiz fans from St Pancras and Ebbsfleet to the Olympic Park at Stratford along the new High Speed One route in a matter of minutes. We were very fortunate in timing that the IOC were, were coming to London uh, two or three weeks just before we were about to, uh, to lay track in the tunnel between Stratford and, and here at, at St Pancras. Holden takes the committee members from Stratford to St Pancras in a fleet of Land Rovers, through the same tunnel where high-speed shuttles will run. I think that probably helped considerably for London to be awarded the Olympics to show what a quick connection there was from this part of London to uh, St Pancras. After the Games, the Olympic site will house a new school, more than 3,000 homes and one of the largest urban parks in Europe. And that's just for starters. High Speed One is much more than a railway and about getting people from, from A to B. It's about bringing dead neighbourhoods back to life. To begin with, regeneration wasn't viewed as, as being particularly important, but in my opinion, it's the most important aspect of this, of this railway. Around here, particularly to the east and to the north of here, was about 67 acres of uh, disused railway land that hadn't been used by the public f forever. The, s the whole area was very downbeat and very depressed, and the local people were fed up with it. They wanted change. In all, almost 200 acres of blight will disappear. Stratford City and King's Cross Central are the two biggest active development sites in London, and they're both enabled by High Speed One. They wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for the railway. As the tracks creep towards St Pancras, a new engineer climbs aboard. Dave Poynton spent half his career working on the Channel Tunnel. Midway through 2005, Rob Holden calls him out of retirement. Thinking there might be a, a few days of interesting work, uh, it was something of a surprise when he said, no, we'd like you to take over and finish the railway. And how could I possibly refuse the opportunity to be there when the last spike went in the rail of a project uh, linking London and Paris? I'd started almost 20 years before. There was still a lot of work to do. Setting ties, laying track, running power lines. They move gas pipes serving half of London without once interrupting service. Near St Pancras, they sink foundation piles within two metres of subway tracks, a feat no one had ever done. And we managed to convince London Underground to let us get on with that work whilst they still had trains running through their tubes. But along their own tracks, they hit a snag. Through the trees behind me is the historic parish church of St Pancras. And in the Victorian times, associated with that church was a large burial ground. 
standing right as far as pretty much where we are standing now. And what the Victorians had to do to build the original station was dig a big trench right the way through that old cemetery. Archaeologists know the bodies were reburied nearby, but how many and just where? And pretty much right below where I'm standing now, we came across thousands of bodies. In actual fact, it was some 7,000 bodies that were uncovered. We were expecting a couple of bodies because we, we were excavating right close to a churchyard, um, but certainly not 7,000. It takes several months to remove and record the bodies. For once, progress yields to history. In the heart of London, another Victorian corpse is about to be resurrected. At St Pancras Station, the renovation reaches the last stage. The cosmetic phase. Beauty here is more than skin deep. Because they're not just creating a place to come and go. It's a place to stop and gaze. In my opinion, not only the big grand ideas matter, but detail also matters. So we put a lot of energy into getting details right. After scraping off decades of paint and discovering the original colour, they repaint the station, Barlow Blue. Hundreds of new doors with Victorian brasswork. Thousands of bricks. 160,000 slate tiles. And a new timepiece, five meters wide. All facsimiles of the originals, as required by English heritage law. We had to use the same stone that they used 150 years ago from the same quarry. We had to use the same clay. We had to use the same mortar. In fact, we tested the mortar on the existing station, did a chemical analysis of it, and then reconstituted that and use that to build the new parts of the station. We've often been asked, why was the station worth preserving? I personally like to think standing here now, the answer is self-evident. November 2007. At St Pancras International, High Speed One welcomes its first passengers. This is the first new railway constructed in this country for over 100 years. It puts us on a par with what's been achieved in France and Germany with high-speed lines. And it's a mega project, a project which, which has been delivered on time and within budget. For those who use it, High Speed One is all about time. London to Paris, in about the time it takes to watch a movie. The builders of High Speed One have succeeded so well, they draw admirers who aren't going anywhere. Previously, you could only get in any way near a train by being a passenger and being on the train. But now you can see the Eurostars close up, even if you're a schoolboy or schoolgirl, and you're not going anywhere near Paris today, and you can dream about going to Paris tomorrow or next year. As Bogart said to Bacall, we'll always have Paris. Now, 